Seven ways you can receive healing for your body today. These are seven scriptural methods that Jesus and the apostles used in ministering the healing power of God to the people of their day. Jesus didn't always just lay hands on people. The apostles didn't always just anoint people with oil. There were several methods implemented in Jesus' ministry and in the apostles' ministry that resulted in people getting healed. But I want to make something clear to you today. No matter the methods that are being used, and continue to be used to this day to minister healing to you, you need to mix faith with that or else the method will produce nothing. It doesn't matter if they lay hands on you until you have no more hair on your head. It doesn't matter if they fill your entire bedroom with oil. If faith is not alive in you, in uh, what the gospel has provided for us as the redeemed, that Jesus didn't come just to save you from sin. He came to save you from the consequences and penalty of sin. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He not only forgives my sins, he healeth all my diseases. And so I need to establish this today. These are all amazing methods that God can heal you today in, in a split second, in an immediate thing. But if faith is not alive, and what do I mean by faith? I mean faith in that it is God's will to heal you, that God wills to do it, God is able to do it, and God is ready to do it. There's a lot of people that believe God's able to heal, but they're not certain whether God wants to heal them. Well, you want to know God's will, you got to look at Jesus. You want to know God's will? Look at Jesus. Jesus always healed the sick that came to him in faith. Not one time in the entirety of the gospel did Jesus turn some away, someone away who came to receive healing from his healing hand in faith? And so if God didn't turn them away, he certainly is not going to turn you away and he's not going to do it ever. There's never a time. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So those people that say, well, that's what Jesus did then, but things have changed now. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So all that to say, if you need healing in your body, God is willing, God is able, no matter if it's stage one or stage four, type one or type two, doesn't matter if it's high or low blood pressure, doesn't matter if it's a pain in your back or a pain in your head. If God is willing, we know that God is able and he's able to do all. The Bible says there is nothing that is impossible for God. There's nothing hard for him. There's nothing remotely even complex for him. Jesus Christ healed all types of diseases and all types of sicknesses every manner of sickness the bible says every manner of disease doesn't matter what it is doesn't matter if the doctors don't have a solution for it he's still the great physician that is above every physician and he's ready he's 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 willing he's able and he's number three ready to heal you today so as we explore these seven ways god god heals people Seven ways to receive uh, healing power in your body today. I want you to keep that in mind. It's faith that activates the healing power of God. No matter the way it's, it's ministered to me, it is faith. Faith in God's willingness, faith in God's ability, and faith in God's readiness to heal me today. Let's get in it. Number one way that God heals people is through the laying on of hands ministers or just not just ministers christians that's the thing is a lot of people teach that we have to go to apostle we got to go to the prophet or we got to go to the pastor but in reality here's what the words of jesus are in mark chapter 16 and verse 15 he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Listen to verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. Not those who are apostles or evangelists or pastors. Just those who simply believe. Those who have faith strong enough to act on what Jesus is about to say. He said, and those, these signs will follow those who believe. What are the signs? In my name, they'll cast out demons. In my name, they'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt or harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. Mark 16 and verse 18 says, 
Jesus, one of his final words before he ascends on high was you are going to go out and if you truly believe, this is one of the signs that's going to follow those who believe. They're going to lay hands on the sick and the sick are going to recover. Why does Jesus say these signs will follow those who believe? Because it takes faith to go out and lay hands on someone and believe that when I'm laying hands on these people, there is a transfer of healing power that's taking place. There is a transference of the anointing to heal the sick that's being that's taking place. There is a healing oil that's being that is being transferred from this vessel into another vessel. God just requires you to do the small thing and he'll go ahead and if you'll do it in faith, he'll go ahead and fulfill it by doing the big thing to heal the sickness, to heal the impossible disease that doctors have no answer to. All you have to do is do the small thing to believe him by laying hands on the sick people that might be around you And God said, I'll do the big thing. You do what's humanly possible for you to do, lay hands on the sick, and I'll do what's humanly impossible to to, to do, and that is I'll have a transference of what I've put in you take place to be put in them, and any sign of sickness and disease will be cleared out of their body. The (coughs) The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, And verse 5, that Jesus went to Nazareth. He could do no mighty works there, miracles, because of their unbelief, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Well, what does that tell you? Even when the people aren't able to receive the word by faith and just receive it in faith, um, the, 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 the benefits of redemption, Jesus showed us that there's a fail-proof method of ministering to the sick. When all other methods fail... Jesus still went ahead to lay hands on a few sick people and they received healing. So that tells you that the laying on of hands is like the last card. If they're not going to receive from any of the other six methods I'm about to go through, the laying on of hands is like the last card because there's, a, there's an actual transference of the, the spirit that's in you that is a bondage-breaking spirit it gets transferred into the person that you're ministering to's body to break the bondage of sickness off their own physical body. Luke 13, Jesus finds a woman that's bent over double and he laid his hands on her and spoke saying, woman, be loosed of that infirmity. That's the thing that I'm, I'm, I, I want to get make it clear to you today. When we minister to the sick, we're not praying, God, if it be your will, we pray that. You. That's not how it happens. Jesus showed us how to do it. He laid hands on the people and he didn't say, God, we're trusting in you. He he spoke, woman, be loosed. So when you lay hands on people or when hands are being laid on you, it's not a time to say, Father, we pray to just comfort this person as they go and endure such hostility against their bodies. It's, It's a time to declare the word of the Lord, the healing power of God over them. We loose you from that infirmity and we release the healing power of God to go ahead and clear out every symptom and sign and trace of sickness and disease. Number one method is the laying on of hands. Acts 28, Paul goes to... Uh, the island of Malta, and the Bible says he entered into the leading citizen of the island's house, his name was Publius, and he went in and laid hands on him, and he was healed. He laid hands. Paul practiced the laying on of hands. Jairus comes to Jesus and says in Mark 5, come and lay your hands on my daughter that she might, she might live. Well, why did Jairus say, come and lay your hands on my daughter that she would live? Possibly because Jairus had been exposed to the ministry of Jesus before and he had seen and witnessed himself that Jesus was laying hands on many people and as a result, healing manifested in their bodies. Number one, laying on of hands. Number two, and I have to add this, when people lay hands on you, let's say this Sunday you go to your pastor or whatever, or you call a friend that believes in healing and you ask them, hey, I've never asked you to do this, could you come lay hands on me? If they come and lay hands on you and nothing changes immediately, it does not mean that the healing power of God has not been activated in your body. Remember, we are people of faith, not of feelings. And faith says that because the Bible says in Mark 16, they will lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. Faith says what God says. 
my faith, because hands have been laid on me, I now say what the word of God says in light of my obedience to the word of God to have hands laid on me. I say what God says, and that is I'm recovering right now. They shall recover. So whether something happens immediately or not does not change my belief in what God is ready and willing and able to do for me right now. It doesn't change. I don't go by what I feel. I go by what the word of God says. And God says, when hands are laid on me, healing is going to manifest. Whether I feel it happen right now or not means nothing to me. I believe in God's word above what I believe my feelings to be. I believe in God's truth above what the facts may be. The fact may be that there's still pain in your body. But the truth is that hands were laid on me and healing is going to manifest regardless. Number two, ways God ministers healing to people or how you can receive healing today is the anointing with oil. James chapter five gives a very uh, specific instruction to the church. You know, James is not talking to just anybody. He's talking to the church. And this is what he says. Are any among you suffering? Let him pray. He's not talking about suffering from sickness. He's saying, are you suffering because of tribulation? Are you suffering because of ill treatment from a loved one or a coworker or whatever? Are you suffering because of the gospel? Pray and God will give you grace to endure. How do we know that? That it's not talking about sickness because let's continue reading. Is any among you cheerful? Let him sing. Is any among you sick? So James shows that there's a distinction in God's eyes between suffering and at the hands of people in persecution and suffering by sickness. Because he says, are any of you suffering? Here's what I'm prescribing for you. You should go out and pray. But then he goes, are any among you sick? He doesn't say you should pray. He says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, not the prayer of request, not the prayer of petition. Remember, I've taught on this several times in our broadcast that there's different types of prayers that have different types of rules that govern those different types of prayers i can't go and play basketball with the rules of football i can't go and i can't just go on a basketball court and start knocking people out i can't have mma rules playing soccer i can't just you know someone takes the ball from me and then i put him in a rear naked chokehold it don't work that way there's different rules that govern different sports. In the same vein, there's different rules that govern different types of prayers. And so there's the prayer of request. Paul talks about in Philippians 4, 6, whereas we're, we're asking God for something. Asking you shall receive. We're asking God for, um, you know, a job promotion. Or we're asking God for peace or joy or whatever. But Paul, uh, James says here in verse 15 of chapter 5 that there's the prayer of faith that's going to save the sick. Well, what's the prayer of faith? The prayer of faith has nothing to do with asking God for something. The prayer of faith is praying, God, I thank you that you've already provided healing for me at the cross, that by his stripes, everything that was necessary for me to partake of your healing power was already paid. The debt's paid. The bill is paid. I just need to sit at the table of God and feast on the children's bread, which is healing for our bodies. The prayer of faith takes the prayer of request asks. The prayer of faith takes. Father, I thank you that you've done everything necessary for me to be healed. As hands are laid on me and oil's been put on my forehead and I've been anointed and the elders are praying over me. The prayer of faith is... I receive your healing power by faith. I receive the finished work of the cross by faith. I'm not asking to be healed because I know you've already done it 2,000 years ago. I'm just taking it by faith. Anointing with oil. Mark 6, 13, the Bible says that the disciples went everywhere, casting out demons and anointing with oil those that were sick and healing them. Number three, the gifts of the Spirit. You can be healed by a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Working of miracles, gifts of healings. Uh, those, two, uh, those two gifts predominantly, when they manifest, will bring forth healing for people, healing in their bodies. Uh, what's the difference of just hearing with faith and being healed of gifts, in the gift of the Spirit? Well, the, when the gifts of the Spirit are manifested through an anointed minister or ministry, what happens is, in my experience, is when the gifts of healing are manifest, 
or the working of miracles, anybody that has faith to come in contact with that person's hand, like Oral Roberts used to do, his hand would heat up and he knew when his hand heated up that the gifts of healing was manifested. And so anybody, everybody would just come and line up and everyone that lined up would get healed supernaturally because the gift of the spirit was being was, was, was in manifestation. When the gifts of the Spirit are in manifestation, the Bible says it brings profit to all. That's in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. So we're talking about the manifestation of the gift. This doesn't always happen. Not every time someone ministers does the gifts of the Spirit manifest. Sometimes it's just through the hearing of faith, and we're going to get into that. But when the gifts, to my experience, and I've heard other men of God like R.W. Schombach and A. A. Allen, they've spoken of it this same way. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in manifestation, it's, 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 it's like a flood of God's power where everybody in the meeting gets healed. I've had this happen several times where we've had everyone in the meeting get healed. Everyone that had faith to come and receive hands laid on them or however I ministered to them because the Holy Ghost gift was in manifestation. Every single ailment, every single infirmity was cleared out of the people's bodies. I remember in Saskatoon, in one night, there was a lady that had a, a stage four brain cancer healed, and then a man, a man that had an incurable heart condition, I remember calling him out, and I had a word of knowledge. I said, put your hand on your heart, God's going to heal your heart. Well, when I said that, this ties into the gifts of the Spirit producing healing for people's bodies. When I said that, just even just the gift, because remember, the gifts of the Spirit, oftentimes they're like chains links on a chain. You you start to operate in one and it just links you up with another one and then it's like a it's like a chain reaction. It just kicks into motion these different gifts. Well, when I gave the word of knowledge that his heart was going to be healed and I'd never met him before, he had then faith to receive healing for his body and then the heal, the gifts of healing activated and he received his incurable heart condition was cleared out and cured and he received a new heart that night. Totally healed by the power of God. Number four, method of, of receiving healing is handkerchiefs, aprons, cloths, or point of contact items. This happened to me in Dominican Republic. I was, pray, I was preaching on healing one night and my translator, who was translating my message, had faith to have his father-in-law healed. He said, can you come and pray for my father-in-law? He's about an hour away from here. My driver said, we can't go that direction. We need to be at this other location by tonight or whatever. So we, we couldn't go. But here's what I said. I had a handkerchief in my pocket. I lifted it up and I said, I can't physically be where you are, where you're your father-in-law is, who was, by the way, they had already been making funeral preparations because he was dying of a lung infection and the dengue fever. And so I said, though I can't come physically, here's my handkerchief. Go and lay hands on your father-in-law tonight with this handkerchief that I prayed over. And he's the same way as if I was there. You can, we can agree together and God's going to heal your father-in-law. Well, he could have easily have taken it and said, that's foolish. You know, that's just, uh, that's just foolish thinking. There's no way that's going to happen. Instead, he had faith. He took the, the handkerchief. He went to where his father-in-law was and he ministered healing power to him. And the next morning, not three weeks later, the next morning, his father-in-law, who was pretty much in coma, coma state, was woken up having breakfast he, he uh, the translator walked into the kitchen that day and saw him there reading the newspaper having cereal and he said what are you doing how are you how are you up and he said well I don't know I just feel great this morning I feel like the lung infections cleared out and Lord, the Lord healed him right then and there and he lived many I don't know he's probably still alive today I haven't checked in but the Lord healed him and I, I remember two years later checking in on him and his father-in-law was still great he was testifying in churches afterwards and and he began to to encourage others with that same healing uh, testimony Acts 19.11, the Bible says God worked extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body and sick people were healed and those that had demons were delivered supernaturally. The Bible says that the woman with the issue of blood, blood touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was made well. That's a point of contact. There was a, uh, she didn't touch Jesus himself, she just touched his cloth. There's a thing that happens when you have an overflow of the anointing 
anointing that it gets on your garments. It gets on your cloth. I'm telling you, it's like the residue of the anointing. And you know what's amazing? An amazing truth and all that? Just the residue of the anointing that was on Paul, that was on me, was enough to clear out the devil that had a plan to kill that translator's father-in-law and the people in Paul's day. The residue of the anointing, not even the full force of it, just the residue, just the, the, the crumbs that are left over was more power, more than enough power to clear out any type of sickness and disease that might be present in your body today. Number five, the prayer of agreement. This happens when the person we're praying for is incapacitated. Mark 18, 16 says, where two of you on earth shall agree concerning anything that they might ask, it shall be enforced by my Father in heaven. So when someone's incapacitated, you go to a hospital, so there's people that ask me all the time, well, what if I can't preach healing to the people so that they have their own faith? Or what if they're not, uh, they're not, uh, they're not awake? They're in a coma. They're, they're, they've, been, um, they've been put into an induced coma. They're not aware. They're not... They don't have the mental ability to actually believe for themselves. What then? Well, this is where the prayer of agreement comes in. You can actually come in with someone else. You go two by two. Jesus sent his disciples two by two. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth oftentimes went to pray for the sick and he'd bring someone with him because there's power in agreement. Jesus said, where two of you on earth shall agree. And what do I mean by, what does Jesus mean by agree? It doesn't mean you go and get someone who's going to pray an opposite prayer to what you're praying in faith. You go out and pray in faith. God, we know that you're going to heal this person right now. We receive it by faith. We call it done. We curse sickness. And then you ask the person to pray for the, uh, you know, to agree with you in prayer. And they're just praying, Lord, we just, we just hope you do something. We just hope that you'll, you'll do something because uh, uh, we don't know how they're going to be able to, continue on like this if if you could just take them just take them they're in incredible pain right now well there's obviously a disagreement but the between the two because one's praying for them to live and the other one's praying for them to die so you can't find someone who's gonna who's not on the level of faith that you're at find people of faith and when you do that there's an enormous power that's released when two faith warriors get together to pray the prayer of faith uh, over somebody that might be incapacitated. Smith Wigglesworth tells the story of uh, he went to somebody's house who was dying uh, of cancer and and uh, he brought someone to pray with him and they just began to pray and then started to just uh, just speak the, the name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. As they began to sing and speak the name of Jesus after they prayed the prayer of faith, that person that was pretty much in a state of coma lifted up on their bed and they said I see Jesus at the foot of the bed and the moment they said that Air Wigglesworth and everyone that was in that room fell prostrate under the power of God they fell under the power it was too thick the Shekinah of glory of God was too thick the the heavy weight of God's presence was too thick they fell on the ground and the man who was sick said I see Jesus and he stood up and he lived and the cancer was cleared out and he was divinely healed that moment. What happened? He, he had no power to believe he was in a state of coma. But when two people came together and agreed in faith, not Lord, whatever your will is. No, we know what your will is and we release our faith to believe you for it. That person who didn't have the ability to believe for themselves was raised up from their sickbed. Number six, casting out a demon. How do you minister to the sick? Sometimes. There's a demon that needs to be cast out. Now understand this, all sickness is of the devil. All sickness is of the devil. Every form of sickness and disease is satanic in origin. In that there was none in Eden, it was when Satan took over the world. Remember 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says the God of this world. Speaking of Satan, Jesus referred to G uh, Satan in John 14.30 as the prince of this world. He said the prince of this world cometh and he has nothing in me. So... Uh, you know, when Satan tempted Jesus and said, all of the kingdoms of the world and all the authority of this, of this world has been given unto me. Jesus didn't contest them and say, that's a lie. They belong to my father. No, because when Adam sinned, Satan legally took over the authority and dominion over the system of this world. When we get redeemed, we're transferred out of that system into the system of the kingdom of heaven. That's why we can have divine healing. It is the privilege and the right for every born again believer. However, um, because of the fall of man, 
sickness continues to, to plague and pollute the bodies of men worldwide. Now, all sickness is satanic in origin. Some sicknesses, there is an actual demon spirit behind it that's causing the life of that sickness to continue to flourish. Luke 13, 10 through 18, Jesus saw a woman bent double and said, ought not this woman who is bound by Satan, ought she not be, ought she not be loosed from this infirmity on the Sabbath? And he said, this, uh, the Bible says that she was bound with a spirit of infirmity. So the Bible doesn't say she had, you know, a natural disease. It was a spirit of infirmity. In Matthew chapter 9 and 32 to 34, the Bible talks about a man that was brought to Jesus that was mute and had a demon spirit. And he cast the demon out and the mute man spoke. So you can see that when a spirit is in a person's body, they can have a level of influence over their physical body to cause weakness, to cause sickness, to cause disease, to cause pain and symptoms to flourish. Why do you think cancer has a life to it? Doctors, they talk about the aggressive life of a cancer. They said this one's an aggressive cancer. Well, that's a demon spirit. There's a life to that cancer. And until this demon spirit is cast out, uh, that, that life is not, that's why doctors and, and all the advancement in medical, all the billions we pump in to find a cure for cancer, it doesn't do squat. Because there's a, there's a spiritual reality behind that cancer. And until the demon is dealt with by the power of the name of Jesus, that cancer ain't gonna go anywhere. And then there's other diseases. You know, people come to me all the time. Doctors don't know what's happening. They, they've tried to diagnose me. They've run me through CAT scans and everything. I've, they're not doubting that I feel this way, but it seems like there's no ability to get to the root of that thing. There's no natural explanation. Well, I don't believe you're lying either. There's not a natural explanation for everything that happens in people's bodies. That's why Jesus, one out of three people that Jesus healed, he dealt with a demon spirit that was at work. And so I'm not saying all people that have a sickness are being attacked by a devil or that there's a, a, a specific attack happening against their body, that there's a demon spirit at work that needs to be cast out of their body. But I do believe that at least one third of the cases, if that's what the gospels show us, at least one third of people that are sick uh, ha, ha, there's a demon at work. And the way you can tell, oftentimes, is that, like I said, it's an incurable thing. It's something that can only be treated. Those are oftentimes telltales that, uh, that there's, there's a, a foreign entity that is attacking a person's body. Number six, casting out a devil. The good news is, is once you take authority, which you have, because Jesus said, I give you power and authority over all unclean spirits to cast them out. So if someone comes to you and, and you feel there's an unclean spirit, that's and I felt that by the discerning of spirits, I can tell whether someone just needs to be prayed for and we take uh, we just curse the tumor or whatever, or there's an actual demon spirit at work and I don't pray, with the, pray for them the same way. When it's just a prayer of faith, I say, Father, we thank you that your healing power has been... Uh, has been uh, granted to us by the stripes of Jesus, we receive it by faith. When it's somebody, or we take authority over this sickness in Jesus' name. When it's somebody that's carrying a demon spirit, I address the demon. You foul devil of deafness, or you devil of blindness, or you spirit of infirmity. That's causing this. You know, another way you can tell it's a spirit of infirmity is when the person has like 19 different things happening. It's not normal. You shouldn't have 19 different problems in your body. That's the work of a demon spirit. And so we have authority over demon spirits. We can cast them out of others. And you certainly don't have to tolerate it in yourself. Number seven, and this one is what I'm going to focus on the most. He hearing with faith. Galatians chapter three. Listen to this. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. This only I want to hear from you, Paul said. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Verse 5 says, He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
Now turn with me to Luke chapter 6. This is the best way to get healed. Easiest way to get healed. <clears throat> and it's the, it's the um, most convenient way to be healed. Because let me tell you, you feel an alarming symptoms at 3 a.m. You can't call pastor. He ain't going to answer you. Can't have people lay hands on you. They're not going to be there. Sometimes you're going to be all alone. Well, there's a way. There's a method that's fail proof that you can receive healing anytime, anywhere, no matter what. Luke chapter 6, listen to this. And beginning with verse 17. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples. And a great multitude of people came who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. He, they came to do what? They came to hear him first and be healed. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So when they heard Jesus, faith to be healed came alive in their hearts so that they didn't have to rely on someone else laying hands on them. They themselves, remember Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Because you have generated by the word of God of faith to be healed for yourself, you can then take that healing that's already been provided for you by force, by faith, and receive it wherever you're at. Luke 5, 17, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching. So what was Jesus doing? He was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So Jesus was teaching, obviously on divine healing, because why would faith come alive in the people to receive, uh, so that the power of the Lord was present there to heal them? It doesn't say the power of the Lord was present there to save them. Acts chapter 14, Paul's preaching at Lystra, and there's a man who's a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked, and he's there, and the Bible says he listened to Paul speak intently, and Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. Paul's preaching, obviously Paul's gospel included not only salvation from sick, sin, but salvation from sickness and disease. How do we know that? Because the man had faith not to say, hey, I want to have my sins forgiven. He had faith to be healed. And Paul said, stand up on your feet. Hearing with faith. Matthew 8, the centurion, sent people to Jesus, come. My servant is lying dreadfully tormented full of demons. Jesus approached the home and he sent other people to Jesus and said, hey, hey, you're, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. And he spoke the word and his servant was made well that self same hour. Hallelujah. Just say the word. Why did he say that? Because he said, I'm a man under authority. I say to somebody, go, he goes, come and he comes. The centurion understood the power and authority of the spoken word and receiving the word for yourself, that it's incontestable. He said, when I say to a servant, go, he can't contest me or I'll have his head on a platter. He goes and does it. I recognize that you're the one who has power and authority over sickness and disease. I know that your word alone has more than enough power to blast off every sickness and every demon spirit off my servant. And so just say the word. He understood authority. Remember, Ecclesiastes says, where, uh, in, the, in the word of a king, there is power. Or where the word of a king is, there is power. Jesus is the king of kings. He's the king of kings. He's the king and has authority over every sickness and every disease. And so just his word, Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Hearing with faith is the fail-proof method and it is the most convenient method and timeless method to be healed at any time, anywhere. And that's the way you, you develop your faith to be healed is by exposing yourself to messages on divine healing. And I'm not talking about messages that explain why people don't get healed. I'm talking about messages that explain or preach, proclaim rather, the Jesus of the Bible. That went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Preaching that generates faith 
for you to receive healing today. Philip went to Samaria and he preached Christ to them. He didn't preach his opinions or his thoughts on the gospel. He preached the gospel. He preached Christ. He preached Christ the healer. How do we know that? Because multitudes that were lame and paralyzed got up and they walked. Those are seven methods you can receive healing for your body today. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that they would receive faith from this word today. Faith to have a manifestation of this wonderful thing called divine healing in their bodies. In Jesus' name, we take authority over every sickness and disease. As they've put their faith, as they heard today, that you're not only willing, you're able and you're ready to heal their bodies. I ask you right now, let your electrifying spirit zap right through their body and put an end to every sickness and disease. I take authority over every demon spirit that might be causing the pain in your body, and I cast it out. Receive healing for your body now. I loose the healing power of God into your body in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1 p.m., we have broadcasts on our YouTube channel. Join us there. Subscribe, like, comment. Until next time, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.